researchers who have written books on extraterrestrial related phenomena, but only one is the unofficial historian to the field. Our next speaker ascended to that position with the 2002 publication of UFOs and the National Security State Chronology of a Cover Up, 1947 to 1973. This historian solidified this role with publication of volume two last year, and he's now working on the final volume, taking us to the present day. His approach is not by accident. He studied history, English, and philosophy at Alfred University, and received a scholarship to study at Oxford University, choosing to do graduate work at the University of Rochester, focusing on German and Soviet studies and the American Cold War diplomacy. Through the late 90s, he conducted a systematic bibliographic research, uh, hunting down many out of print books and UFO documents released over the years through the Freedom of Information Act. He found the amount of information nearly overwhelming, even for him. A detailed chronology of relevant events was prepared in advance of writing his critically acclaimed first book, which provided a comprehensive but concise historical narrative of the problem. He's done a great deal of television work, having appeared on many documentaries for the History Channel, Sci-Fi Channel, BBC, and elsewhere. In 2006, he was, a, he was host to a six episode series for the Sci-Fi Channel called Sci-Fi Investigates. He's the only speaker to present at all six conferences. Please welcome Richard Dolan to X Conference 2010. <laughs> Thank you for your patience today. Um, Steve, I think, explained. Hold on. OK. Welcome. It's a, it's a pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. To those of you uh, watching this live on your computer, let me welcome you to the ghetto. <laughs> and to those of you who are here, thank you. Um, I know we're. Steve said we're on schedule, but I'm going to try to be efficient with our time. Um, I've got a lot to cover here. Yes, I'm Richard Dolan. I've been writing about this topic for um, a little over 10 years now. been researching it for about 15 or, or, or so years. Um, I think that we're having something of a historical moment here. Uh, there have been press conferences on the UFO topic here at the National Press Club in the past, but this is the first conference on this topic that, that I know of that's ever been here. Um, and I think we, we should recognize that. And I also uh, agree with Stephen that the, the fact that we're attempting this live streaming, this is just the beginning. I think this is going to be the advanced guard of many, many more such attempts. And I'm looking forward to seeing how that all plays out. Uh, the topic that I want to cover with you today is uh, the UFO cover-up, its history, its end, and beyond. So in a sense, it's looking back and it's looking ahead. So let's get started. I've got, uh, tried to organize this topic in as easy a way as possible. Five general themes that I want to discuss with you today. The first part is to emphasize that the UFO phenomenon is a military problem. You will see why in a moment. The second part is what we might call the structure of the secrecy. In other words, how does this all work? How do the so-called powers that be keep this from being officially acknowledged? And how do they, um, you know, how do they uh, work with, do this within the clandestine world, the classified world? The third part is an attempt to understand what is this secret program all about? Okay, so if you've got the secrecy, well, what are you doing with that secrecy? And then the fourth part is a concept that I've introduced in my, my most recent book. I call it a breakaway civilization. I'll explain to you uh, what I mean by that. And then the fifth and final part would be my attempt to look ahead, uh, prognosticate what will happen if and when the truth on this topic is known, and it will be known. I've often known described the disclosure of the UFO reality as a paradox. I've often said it's impossible, but nevertheless, it's inevitable. It's both. It is impossible because 
those groups and individuals who know this secret and who really are read into the program have no incentive, none that I see, for wanting this information out. And nevertheless, not them, not anybody is going to have the power to stop it. History is moving much too fast. And uh, I will make that argument in a little more detail. So part one, we call the military problem. I, I will uh, do a very brief summary of some of the what I think are the more important documents that prove, not that UFOs are alien necessarily, but that do prove that UFOs are a problem from a national security point of view, and a problem of uh, anomalous uh, objects. So let's go. I like this little list. I've sat down many times and asked myself, well, what's the, you know, there are, not everyone on this, studying this topic is on the same page, so to speak. There are people here who not only know that UFOs are real, but they know the nature of the extraterrestrials or aliens that are here, or at least they'll tell you that they know. And then there are other people who are not so sure. There are people in this room, I'm, I'm certain, who are not sure that the problem is even legitimate. They need to be shown. That's fair. So what I want to do is go over what I think is a short list of good very good UFO documents that describe this problem well enough uh, to give an idea of what we're talking about. Those of us who've done research, I think, are very knowledgeable of this first document, the 1947 Twining Memo. Over 50, 60 years ago, General Nathan Twining, three-star general at Air Material Command at Wright Field, wrote a memo which is, uh, I think, an important one in response to a general Charles Shulgin, who asked him, essentially, what's going on with all this flying saucer business? Do I need to do anything about it? Are we making them? Essentially is what Shulgin wanted to know. Twining wrote a memo, many pages, three, three full pages, in which, to summarize, he stated the phenomenon is real, not visionary or fictitious. According to the military reports coming in, according to Twining, there are very specific features about these objects that were being seen. Among them, they were silent or nearly so, well-kept formations of flight, evasive upon sighting, round on top, flat on bottom, round or domed on top, flat on bottom. Now ask yourself, what objects in 1947, or today for that matter, 1947, would be domed on top and flat on the bottom? Interesting. And so much more. It's an interesting memo, it's an important memo, and to this day, despite the fact that any UFO researcher probably knows it inside and out, it still really has no play in the popular uh, consciousness. There's a bunch of these. I'm gonna open up the list here and just describe a few of them. Um, the 1949 FBI memo, very detailed, describing the matter of flying saucers, according to uh, Air Force Intelligence, as being listed as top secret, and you might wanna ask yourself, well, why? Did the Air Force consider this matter top secret in 1949? That memo gives some pretty good ideas why, one of which had to do with violations of sensitive airspace that were not explainable at that time, nor are they today. Many of these documents uh, also describe various types of airspace violations that were a very important matter to the military authorities at the time. Uh, one of the most important of these documents, I would say, is the 1952 memo to the director of the CIA, Walter Bedell Smith, by his director of scientific intelligence, H. Marshall Chadwell, in which Chadwell, this is in December of 1952, after a lot had happened in this nation regarding the UFO problem, Chadwell said to his director, objects, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but I'll give it as accurately as I can recall, Objects sighted at high altitudes over sensitive installations are of such nature that they are not attributable to natural phenomenon, phenomena or known types of aerial vehicles. Okay? It's about as explicit a statement in a memo of that classification that you're going to find. Bureaucratic language just doesn't work like boss, we're being invaded. They don't say it like that. But it's a pretty explicit statement. And, and so on, a number of these. I could go on and on with a detailed description of all of them, and, and um, I don't think it would be worth our while today. Uh, I will point out, though, many of these memos indicate that these objects have the ability to switch off our weapons systems. 
All right, so uh, for example, the 1966 mine at Air Force Base uh, document makes it very clear that an object was seen by a strike team tracked on NORAD radar coming down, landing uh, just outside the base. When the strike team went to investigate, their communication systems went offline, static disrupted all of their communications. They saw visually this object on or near the ground, and then it took off, tracked on NORAD radar uh, at 100,000 feet and gone, whatever this thing was in 1966. The following year, 1967, at Malmstrom Air Force Base, I misspelled Malmstrom, I just see that there. Uh, this is very well known. It should be better known. At two locations at Malmstrom, glowing, Red UFOs, whatever these things were, were seen by personnel above missile silos, which simultaneously went offline. Up, possibly 20 missiles went offline that day in March of 1967. And we know this happened. It is not a matter of debate. It's not one of these things where you can say, well, that's what they claim. We've got the documents by Boeing, which had to do a study of the missiles, which were mystified. There was no reason they could understand why these missiles should have gone offline. But what we know is that personnel above ground saw these objects. And on and on. In 1975, there were, again, an awesome series of airspace violations along the U.S. northern border and into Canada. These are unexplained to this day. The 1981 HALT memo describing the Rendlesham Forest case certainly one of the top five UFO events, I would say, is another instance in which an object was seen with a beam of light penetrating <coughs> nuclear, a nuclear weapons uh, facility that was not supposed to be there, by the way. It was secretly there. And according to the deputy base commander, Charles Halt, a number of years later, he said that that object adversely affected the ordinance, and whatever he meant by that. So these objects have the ability, and, and then I should mention the 1976 Defense Intelligence Agency memo dealing with the Iranian jet fighter incident, again in which an object, an unknown object, was able to disable two F-4 interceptors in succession. As they got to a range of 25 nautical miles, their key instrumentation went offline, in one case right before the pilot was about to fire a missile at this thing. So whatever they are, they are a national security concern and they have the ability to disable our military equipment, high tech sophisticated equipment. Okay, those are some documents and the story doesn't end in 1990 with those documents. The problem is simply that uh, freedom of information has had its ups and downs. Glory era was certainly in the 19, uh, late 70s, the Carter years, I think we can say, when literally more than half, to this day, more than half of all of the government UFO documents we have came from that period. There was an executive order in 1982 that severely limited FOIA, and it's not completely dead in the water, but it's, um, it's not what it was. Nevertheless, we know encounters have continued through the 90s and through our own century. Uh, this one, of course, is very well known. I wanted to describe it here because we're in Washington. Just outside this city, just outside, uh, a number of individuals saw F-16s chasing multiple objects that have not been explained, but that were, the Air Force did acknowledge that something unknown was tracked on their radar and that they did scramble at least two F-16s. Uh, this gentleman that I'm interviewing here uh, retired police officer Gary Dillman was, I think, the first person to see the objects at all. He claims to this day that he saw four unidentified objects, large ones, being chased by four F-16s. Uh, later witnesses uh, in the town of Waldorf, Maryland, saw one object being chased by two F-16s. All of the witnesses describe this object as absolutely outclassing the intercept. And of course, this is the theme that we get over and over again. Whatever they are, we cannot compete with them militarily. Now, the Air Force spokesman, wouldn't you love to be the Air Force spokesman to describe this to the media? I wouldn't. 
<laughs> so he says, well, you know, we did track something. Uh, yeah, that's true. It could have been any number of things. I'd like to know what number of things it could have been. I'd like to know what it could be. What blue object is able to outperform, to, to come down at an 80 degree angle and then stop, according to the witnesses, wait for the F-16s to catch up and then shoo, take off? Yeah, I'd like to know. Post 9-11 America, I think we'd all like to know, wouldn't we? Uh, the very well-known event, again, I speak, this is all relative, well-known to researchers, the UFO event at Stephenville, Texas, Central Texas. It's a fascinating case, and the image that you see there is not a photograph of this, it's an artist's reconstruction, uh, describing what the object may have looked like, comparison with the size of two F-16s there. So what people saw was this enormous, absolutely huge object zooming along at low altitude, stopping then over Stephenville. Well, what's up with Stephenville? Who cares about that place, right? Well. I don't know exactly, but what we do know is uh, researchers, some dogged researchers, were able to obtain FAA transcripts. Uh, Cheryl, you wanted to bring me something here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have, Richard, you have extra time. <laughs> Go to 12.15. Well, good. I'll use it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. What we know is that the FAA radar data that was obtained uh, by some researchers indicated that this object, after it uh, resumed its course, I'm not making this up, although it may sound like it, was last seen going exactly in the direction of the Crawford Ranch where President George W. Bush was staying at that time. This is true. Now, what we don't know is whether it landed or ended up there, because as the FAA said, well, we don't have that data. So you can choose to believe that if you wish. They don't have that data, but they do, they did supply the data that indicated this object was going to exactly in the direction of the Crawford Ranch. So I think that is interesting. There are a number of witnesses describing how enormous this object was, by the way. One of them described it as something like a flying Walmart. <laughs> And what could be scarier than flying Walmarts? That's just, <laughs> I'm, I'm out of here when they do that. I'm gone. I'll go to Canada. So briefly, I just wanted to make the point that I think there's more than enough documentation to, to prove. Again, not that UFOs are alien necessarily, but that our guys are chasing them. I would like to point out, it's not just America. Uh, I was uh, earlier in my lecture thinking that I would want to include a reference to some of the Soviet counters that we know about. Paul Stonehill, uh, an outstanding researcher of Russian and Soviet UFO um, encounters, is here, and I'm sure that he'll be talking about that. I would mention, though, that during the period of the end of the Soviet Union, when uh, Glasnost and Perestroika were in full force, that is when the leaks occurred in that nation, of course. And what we learned is that the Soviet Union also had an, a large number of attempted intercepts of these objects, and they were equally outclassed by them. So it's a worldwide phenomenon. So something is going on. Uh, interceptions and military close encounters have been a constant feature of the UFO phenomenon from the 1940s until the present day. That has not stopped. It's one important thing to keep in mind when we talk about the future of this phenomenon and disclosure. What we're going to have to deal with, of course, is why have we been chasing these things? There's some kind of trouble in paradise. What is going on? So keep that in mind, please, until I go to the second part of this lecture, the structure of secrecy. Now, it's one thing to say that we have a UFO phenomenon. It's one thing to say that there are these unexplained objects that are being chased. Okay. That's one hurdle, and that's a difficult one for a lot of people. That's, a, that's enough for a day's work, right, to prove that. And yet, it goes further. What we have found over the years is that uh, we're not in the area of necessarily confirmed documents, but let us say leaks from very prominent, respectable, brilliant, plugged-in people who have talked about, yes, possession of alien technology and alien bodies at 
deeply classified levels. Now, the uh, top name on this list here is that of a, a researcher of the UFO topic, Leonard Stringfield. He's no longer with us. In fact, uh, only one of these people are with us. That's Dr. Edward Mitchell on that list. Leonard Stringfield, uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, up to his death in 1994, was a conduit for many military people who trusted him and went to him and described stories about having seen uh, either alien bodies at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or having been attendant at a recovery of a crashed UFO or something along those lines. Or the widow of, of someone who had done security detail at Wright Pat where alien bodies were seen and so forth. Stringfield collected uh, several dozen, several score of such stories. Not every single one could be confirmed and probably a few of them may not have been as accurate as he thought, but I think a lot of them were. The assessment of those of us who studied them is that there's enough smoke that there had to be some fire here. But that's only one person. We've had direct statements from a number of very confirmable, prominent individuals. Senator Barry Goldwater famously uh, stated a number of times, he was very close friends with Curtis LeMay, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, and Goldwater uh, admitted. And here's Goldwater, ran for president in 1964, Republican, military friendly, he was an Air Force Reserve General. You'd think that a guy like Goldwater would, might know about these secrets, and yet Goldwater stated multiple times that when he attempted to get information about this topic from his friend Curtis LeMay, on one occasion he said he was cussed out by Curtis LeMay, who told him in no uncertain tones, don't ever ask me about that again. Uh, Dr. Robert Sarbacher, who's uh, the black and white photograph in the center, a very prominent defense scientist of the 1950s and 60s, toward the end of his life in the 1980s, for whatever reason, admitted in a two-page typewritten single-space letter to a researcher that yes, yes, he was very much aware of the efforts to recover crash UFOs and study the beings, which he described as insect-like, according to the scuttlebutt that he was encountering. Uh, he was part of a committee to study this phenomenon, he said. And uh, some researchers ended up speaking to Sarbacher. He gave them the name of Dr. Eric Walker, who is still alive. Dr. Walker is uh, this gentleman right here. Dr. Eric Walker was one of the very top defense scientists of the 1950s and 60s, later went on to become president of Penn State University. Eric Walker also made some startling admissions about the nature of this cover-up the nature of the uh, program to study alien technology and bodies. He, ad he admitted to several researchers that yes, indeed, this is the case. Mm -hmm. um, not just in uh, telephone conversation, but he, we have written letters by Walker, um, which I intend to republish uh, by uh, later this year. Ben Rich, former head of Lockheed's Skunk Works Division, uh, also made some statements toward the end of his life in the 1990s about this. And Dr. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, I've spoken with Edgar Mitchell a number of times about this personally. He has spoken publicly about uh, his several individuals that he knows of ultra-elite security clearances who confirmed to him the existence of deeply classified programs to study alien technology and bodies. Now this man walked on the moon he is a legend. He's certainly, um, he's certainly a very clear and brilliant man. And yet, although he's gotten some media attention on this in recent years, it's still not been enough. Isn't NBC curious? Isn't Fox News, CBS, ABC? Where, where's CNN? Really to dig into this story. Is Edgar Mitchell making this up? Well, no, he's not making this up. So again, uh, we've got statements by world-renowned individuals about a topic that is just absolutely of critical importance to us as a species, and yet we have a media blackout. Nonetheless, this is some, by no means all, of the testimony on alien technology and bodies. So let's, let's rewind the, the, the clock here for us a little bit, and let's go back, let's go back to 1947. 
pretend that you're the president of the United States, and assume that you have been informed by somebody that uh, crashes of a crash of someone's technology not belonging to us and not belonging to the Soviets and seemingly interplanetary has occurred. And now your military has got possession of it. So what would you do? I th your instinct might be to tell the world, certainly, but then you might think twice about it. If you tell the world, then you're going to be hard-pressed not to share this technology at some point with the Soviets and with who else? You never know. No, I think the logical thing would be to gather your team together, your reliable people, and have them study it. Of course you would. I think that's exactly what Harry Truman did. This is a p photograph of Harry Truman with his Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, a man who ended his life in 1949 with a 16-floored jump out of the Bethesda Naval Hospital. I wrote in my first volume of history my suspicions that Forrestal didn't just jump, and I stand by that conclusion. It's 60 years later, and we'll probably never get the proof that we want. But keep in mind that Forrestal died 14 years before the Kennedy assassination. The investigation was completely internal by the US Navy. There was no expectation that the public was ever going to get to the bottom of this. If Forrestal had been murdered, do you honestly think in 1949 that the US government would have said so? Clearly not. I think Forrestal died because there was a UFO connection of some sort. That's my opinion. Now, so actually, let me just back up and um, stay on Truman for a moment. If you are the president, you wouldn't want to tell the world about this. You, you wouldn't really want to tell Congress about it because if you tell Congress, that's the same thing as telling the world. And so you'd need to create a, a separate organization, wouldn't you? Something like what we now call MJ-12 or Majestic, I should think so. I think all of the evidence that I have seen, all of the logic points to this conclusion. It would be something outside the formal US governmental structure. Now, as an aside, let us ask, well, who is, who's in control of this dealio here? Is it the president? Well, we elect the president. Our political system is designed, we like to think, to, you know, we have a representative system, right? Don't we? We're in Washington, DC. That's what we're supposed to have. Well, maybe, okay, is the president in control or is it, you know, the guy who puts him in the White House? That's a photograph of David Rockefeller. There's no question, there is no question, at least for the last 50 years, that that man has been the kingmaker of this country. That man and his, the people around him. In the uh, study of my second volume of history, which covers from 1973 to 1991, there is no question that David Rockefeller was the man who said yea or nay to every one of the presidents that we had at that time. If he said yea, he, the guy was in. Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, turns out, was a six-time attendee of the infamous Bilderberg Group meetings during the 1960s. He didn't just come into the White House out of nowhere. It's, it is exactly a legal version of the mafia when you get made. Remember Goodfellas, right? Joe Pesci gets made before they whacked him. Too bad for him. You get made, you get tapped. Bill Clinton attended his first Bilderberg meeting in, guess when, 1991, the year before he was nominated for the Democratic presidential uh, party on, uh, president. And so it goes. Jimmy Carter was almost, almost literally lifted up by Rockefeller and Zbigniew Brzezinski and dropped into the White House in 1977. Uh, keep this in mind, please, as we, as we continue with the, um, <clears throat> the next section of this theme. Because when you were talking about retrieval of UFO technology, I believe I've been arguing for some time that it has been necessary to collaborate with private industry in this. You have to. If you want to, if you've got this piece of alien artifact and you want to study it, you want to replicate it, well, at some point it's going to have to go to Boeing or Lockheed or General Electric, Raytheon. 
wherever. These are the companies that have the people. They've got the engineering personnel. They've got the scientific expertise. They can make this. <laughs> if anyone can make it or replicate it, they can. They're going to have to get possession of it. And what that will mean is that at some point, if, if I'm the Army and uh, here's Boeing and I give them this little thing, well, then who owns it? Well, presumably, the attorneys would hammer out some covert agreement, and by which maybe there would be some sharing of ownership. It's a great idea. It makes perfect sense. We have a government that, really, since the assassination of Lincoln, has been dominated only by leaders of industry and finance. And so they've essentially managed for the most part, U.S. Uh, policy, domestically and foreign policy, for 150 years anyway. Every one of the major advisors to the U.S. president and members of organizations like the Council on Foreign Relations, which, again, is explicitly uh, created by and for the leaders of industry and finance. And they have dominated the U.S. State Department. They've dominated all of the branches of the executive um, government for about 80 years, 70 years. And privatizing the secret helps with secrecy, clearly. Because now it's not classified as proprietary. It's a trade secret. It's not a matter of public inquiry. It's private. And once you, the four-star general who's involved in handing this technology over, retire from the, uh, the force that you're in, you become a senior VP with this company, and you make a lot of money, and you've got a good life. You've got the revolving military industrial nexus working for you, that revolving door, who's going to rock the boat? How do you pay for this research? It's got to be expensive. It's got to be expensive. Think about this. I, I spoke to one uh, insider. He's famous, famous person, a very brilliant man, who said to me explicitly that the, uh, by all estimates that he was able to ascertain, the, the money that went into, that goes into the security of this program is about seven to eight times more than the money going into scientific R&D. So it's vastly more expensive to maintain the secret. I don't have a breakdown of the accounting. <laughs> that would be nice. But I might think you've got underground infrastructure possibly to build, right? Guns. Uh, management of media, all of these things cost money. Presumably that's what he's talking about. It's a lot of money, and you can't necessarily requisition it openly from Congress. So how do you do it? You gotta keep it hidden. It might help to divert a lot of uh, funds covertly. Anyone who's really bothered to investigate, not just the CIA, but you really look at any major intelligence agency of other nations, and you look at connections dealing with such unseemly topics as narcotics trafficking, stock market fraud. These connections come up, all right? And certainly when they make it to the mainstream, there's all kinds of spin control to minimize the impact of these revelations, but they are out there. Your public library has got very good sources on this. There's a lot of funny business going on in the world of intelligence. And look, if you want to raise private armies, you want to subvert elections, you want to kill people secretly and not anyone know about it, well, it certainly helps to have your own stash of cash that you don't have to explain. And so uh, there's obviously an incentive here. So what I would suggest, and if there are students in this room who are watching uh, of the black budget, people interested in that, I, I would suggest that, that the UFO secret is possibly the originator, or certainly one of the main forces behind the creation of a black budget. Students of the black budget continually miss this point because they're afraid to look at UFOs. God forbid. But this is a real problem. It involves real money. And going back to the 1940s, this national security issue is prominent enough that it necessitated the creation of an extra-constitutional black budget culture. Not a lot of work has been done on this publicly. This man, Bill Sweetman, an uh, aerospace writer, did a very good article about a decade ago on how these special access programs, or black budget programs, operate. And just simply to summarize, 
Uh, at that time, he estimated there might have been 150 or so of these programs within the Defense Department. Um, basically, he said they don't seem to have much or any oversight, certainly not from Congress. Uh, many of them are unacknowledged, which means that they officially don't exist. Of course, we know they exist. He indicated his research said, well, their classification systems are all unique to themselves. They seem to be uh, entities unto themselves. They're dominated by the private contractors, not the military personnel. His, his estimate, his uh, conclusion was that the DOD liaisons of these programs were little more than gatekeepers of money. That's what their function was but that rather it was the private contractors who dominated these programs. And Sweetman concluded that he really had no idea how they got all their money. That was a decade ago. I'm gonna to return to this theme of the structure of secrecy in a moment. Let's talk about what is this program about. Well, I think it's probably, uh, definitely, about making some UFOs. Yes, I think we can say that pretty confidently. I think it's also about uh, creating a secret space program. Yeah. So let's look at that a little bit. Making UFOs, yes. Studying alien bodies, conducting biotech research, yes. Developing a secret space program. Using all this free money to conduct the research and provide security for it. In other words, the program's about taking your money so that they can study this stuff. It's also about making money from the acquired technology when appropriate, when convenient. That's not hard to understand. You've got this exotic piece of technology. Some of your scientists have a eureka moment at some point, and you might want to spend some of this off into commercial applications and get on the ground floor of something nice. That's not hard to see. But it's also, I think, about hiding most of this from the US military itself after all, you have someone in the military, it doesn't mean that they know anything about this, right? The U.S. military's job, Keep going. What's your U.S. military's job is to protect all of this neat stuff. The U.S. military is being used by these interests for their benefit, plain and simple. And the program is also, and we must remember this, it's about dealing however they can deal. It's about dealing with the presence of non-human intelligences on planet Earth. And that cannot necessarily be an easy thing for them to do from their point of view. So let me expand on this. Making UFOs. Again, I never want to assume that we're all on the same page. There is a lot of work done on this in my, my last book, uh, the second volume of UFOs in the National Security State, subtitled The Cover-Up Exposed, came out last summer. I wrote a lot about this. Uh, I would encourage you to take a look at it. One of the researchers back in the 1980s who, re who really dug into this issue is James Goodall. I wrote Jane, good grief. James Goodall wrote for Jane's Defense, uh, a num number of other very prominent publications. And during the 80s and early 1990s, um, James Goodall just interviewed a number of Groom Lake Area 51 insiders, concluded that there were unconventional technologies in use. There were many deeply classified programs, including a silent flying triangle back in the 80s. Before the world knew about Bob Lazar and his claims about reverse engineering alien craft, James Goodall was also digging into this topic through his own investigations. One of his contacts, Goodall said to him, do you, you know, do you believe in UFOs? And the guy who had 12 years experience at Groom Lake, highly classified, said, absolutely, positively, they exist. Goodall asked, well, would you, can you expand on this for me? The man said, no. Another of his sources said, we have things out there that are literally out of this world, better than Star Trek, better than Star Trek, or anything you can see in the movies. And uh, Goodall again said, well, can you please elaborate? The man said, no. The fascinating piece of uh, video that leaked out in the 1990s made it to the TV show Hard Copy uh, from the Nellis Test Range. This is widely known. Uh, you can see this on YouTube. I'm going to show you a, 
about a 30 second clip of it. There's been a lot of analysis of this object. Uh, websites, you can see here, there's a few that uh, do, I think, very sophisticated analyses. The reason we're able to analyze this object is because the data um, at the top of the, uh, around the screen, it gives the height, the altitude, azimuth, and uh, key uh, positional information on the object so you can track it and, and calculate its speed. The object had a range of speed from a, a low of about 15 or so miles per hour to up to 500 miles per hour within a couple of minutes, zipping around, stopping, going up, down, and so forth. So it was very unusual. This, this was, video was taken in November of 1994. It made a right angle turn at about 140 miles per hour. Pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And I'm going to, uh, uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this. Let's just run the clip here. It should go. Come on. Oh, there it is. Good. Now, I've disabled the sound for this. You can just watch it. And you can see it's moving. Uh, the operators, meanwhile, are asking, well, what is that? Is that a helicopter? It can't be a helicopter. Um, they, they did not know what this was. And it's just doing all kinds of crazy stuff. This is 1994. And so the question is, who's making that? Well, I'm thinking that we made it. I'm not sure, but it was inside Nellis test range. To this day, that object has no home. <laughs> no one's claimed it, all right? It may have even changed its shape. If you really look at the video long enough, it, it seems like it might have, although it's really hard to know for sure. I, I am of the opinion that we probably made this object. That's 15 years ago. So it's a little bit about making the UFOs, a little bit of what I think might be in interesting evidence. There's more, I need to move on. Is there a secret space program? Well, yes, I think, I think there is. And again, I'm scratching the surface here. We've got the case of Gary McKinnon. Gary McKinnon, a UK resident, has been uh, basically in the midst of a living hell for the last decade. Uh, what he tried to do through the 1990s and up, up into the early 2000s was trying to peak. I used to think hacking, but he really wasn't a hacker. Uh, what, you, what Gary McKinnon tried to do is essentially the equivalent of standing at the door waiting for it to be open long enough to get a look inside. Looking at US Space Command website and defense sites and so forth, looking for evidence of a UFO cover-up. And he says he found it. He says he found it. Um, in November of 2000 at the Space Command site, got into an area where he saw a heading of list of officers names under the heading non-terrestrial officers other information in there. What we do know is Gary McKinnon was arrested in November of 2002. So the US defense establishment, yes, has acknowledged that he was getting into things he shouldn't have been getting into. They've been trying to extradite him. This has become a cause celeb, uh, not just within the UFO research field, but in Britain in general. A lot of the, the Brits are a little annoyed about the high-handedness of the US government to just take one of their people. So uh, Gary McKinnon's fate is still up in the air. But what I would simply uh, mention, two things about this case. One is when he was first arrested. I mean, if you, cover, if you look at the news coverage at that time, the UFO connection was very prominently discussed. If you look at McKinnon now in any of the mainstream articles that have come out in the last few years, it's almost never even mentioned, except as a little footnote at the back, at the bottom. So what's happened, you see this evolution in media reportage of the case. At the, the UFO, now he's just known as the greatest Pentagon hacker of all time, which is a load of crap, okay? Gary McKinnon is not anywhere close to the greatest hacker in Pentagon history. But he's described as it, so this is completely unrealistic. He found something, something that they are not happy about. Uh, he's been very consistent about what he's seen. Uh, there's no question that there are anomalies that have been recorded many times. NASA footage, Russian, European Space Agency, and also Chinese missions now. Um, what these things are, I don't know. They don't, 
some of them are explainable. I'm going to show you a couple of clips in a moment. Um, this one here, I wrote about this in my uh, last book. This is, I'm going to play this for you. It's a very brief, it's one second, I'll, I'll play it a couple of times. Uh, I've, I've asked around about this. Uh, I've discussed this with Dr. Bruce McAbee, a Navy optical physicist. The main thing I wanted to know from Bruce is whether this clip is genuine. He said, yes, it's genuine. What it is, I don't know, he said. Well, with, with that knowledge, as long as I, I thought, all right, it's genuine. There's an object that you will see, I'm going to show you in a moment, that will come in. It's going to come into the screen here, and it's going to move off the screen like that. It's a ball. Now, I've looked at this countless times, and I've measured it on my screen. It gets larger. It's moving toward the camera. So it's a, a second clip. I'll replay it a couple of times. Here it goes. If I can, all right, let's try that again. Here we go. Click. Okay, there it is. I'm going to do it again. And it certainly seems to have uh, depth. One more time. Need to get a full clip of that. What that? It's a particle beam. <laughs> Someone flushed the ice crystals out the back, you know. It's interesting. And what I haven't mentioned, of course, is the statements by a number of uh, American and Russian astronauts, uh, Soviet cosmonauts in particular. Many of them, again, during the Glasnost era, were very forthright about some of the objects that they saw that were utterly inexplicable. Now, this is the STS-48 from September 1991. It's, it's quite famous. Uh, possibly everyone in this room has seen it. Um, I wrote about it. I, I'm willing to recognize that both sides of this debate have very good points here, and I don't want to say for sure that this is a Star Wars weapon being uh, shooting at an object, but it sure as heck looks like it. I'm going to run this. This is, I think, 30 seconds. What's going to happen is that right around here, you're going to see an object seemingly just appear. Now, it's been argued that this is a craft of some sort. It's also been argued that this is simply a, an ice crystal or a dust particle moving into a certain area of sunlight where it finally reflects. You're going to see the firing of a, a, a the thruster, thruster of the shuttle from over here. You will not see the orientation of the Earth change at all. It's been argued that the, the, the thruster firing it wouldn't be sufficient to do that anyway. You're going to see the object that appears suddenly move off into a different trajectory, and you're gonna see another object shoot up, zoom like that. You'll also see some of these other objects moving around here. Uh, some of them will change, and some of them will not appear to change their direction. So are these all ice crystals moving around? Here it is. So it's gonna appear around here. There it is, okay? Give it a few seconds. the flash. Zoom again. There it goes. Is there anybody who hasn't seen this before? Uh, a few people. Oh, okay. A few people have not seen it. This is on YouTube. Uh, you can just search STS 48 and you will find many, many clips of this, and you'll find many debates about it as well. Uh, some of the remarks people make are pretty stupid, and others are pretty intelligent. So go through it. Um, now, there, there's a clip here that I'm about to show you that I think is more uh, compelling to me. Uh, this was analyzed by the late Jeff Challender. Uh, Jeff, Jeff was a, a gentleman who... Um, was obsessed by NASA, and he was obsessed by space UFOs. He spent his entire life, his entire adult life, really, collecting video, uh, studying the video, and looking for anomalous phenomena. He died in November 2000, uh, October of 2007, very suddenly. I met Jeff a couple of times, and uh, I met him one time, excuse me, and we knew each other's work, and I, we liked each other. After he died, uh, his website eventually went down. It was gone. It was called Project Prove. Uh, 
Fortunately, I, I um, had did a complete download of his site before it went down, and I asked his widow if I could republish his site, and I have it now as attached to my own site at keyholepublishing.com. You can spend weeks going through that and, and uh, still not go through all of it. I want to show you an event, one, only one that he's got on, on his site, of an object that looks like it's doing a U-turn. This is in a 2005 mission, the STS-114. It's very strange. There's a lot of strange things from that mission. This is one of them. Now, when I move to the slide, it's, it's going to, uh, he speeds, it's all sped up. So it, what looks like a couple of seconds, actually, in reality, took a few minutes. He sped it up for your, so you could see it a little more easily. Um, and it's just going to cycle through. So you'll see it a few times, and here it is. I'm going to watch, and back going to do it again. And I, there's an enhancement of this I'll show you in a moment. It's very odd. Uh, Jeff was no wide-eyed, gullible believer about this. He was a very analytical guy. He certainly didn't think that every anomaly in space was a genuine alien artifact. But he, um, he couldn't explain this one. Now I'm going to uh, move to the next slide, and you can see he does a stabilization of this. And you can see it actually maneuvering, and then Turning around? Is there an optical effect here that we're not getting? What would cause this object to change direction or to appear to change direction in space? I don't know unless it's actually doing that. Um, what I can say very confidently is there's a lot of these <laughs> types of clips. So when we talk about a secret space program, I think what we need to recognize is that there's more than enough motivation for it. If there are anomalies out there, all right, then you can bet that there's going to be more than enough motivation for a com clandestine component to the space program to be in, in effect, if for no other reason than to investigate all of this. Okay? That's assuming that those objects aren't ours. And of course, if they are ours, well, then I guess that would be de facto proof of secret space program also. Uh, I didn't really discuss some of the other elements of the program, such as the biotech research and so forth. We'll leave that for another day. But I do believe that they are a big part of it as well. Let me move to the fourth part. I call this a breakaway civilization. This photograph, incidentally, is from 1966 from Provo, Utah. 